I was talking to one of my colleagues actually earlier today uh, who studied linguistics and he was talking about, you know, you have extinct languages, which just nobody speaks anymore. And then you have dead languages, which people speak, but there's no native speaker. So this would be like Latin. And so they never really changed. It's just Latin is Latin. Um, and then you have living languages that people are actually native speakers of. This is really important when it comes to computer languages and computer software because you know, computers can only really understand what's in a computer. It doesn't understand that there is an outside world. Um, and of course, the information that people want to put in computers changes, like the way we interact with each other changes. And we really want this to be living software that can continue to evolve um, as the demands for it change. All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of the Layer One podcast. It's a special day because we do have Parity Technologies on the podcast today. Before we touch on our guest, I want to throw it over to Dimitri. How are you doing today, Dimitri? What's going on, man? Glad to be back. The duo is back for another podcast, and I'm so excited to talk to today's guest. These guys are definitely legit. Yeah, absolutely. They're probably one of the most legit teams in the space. Uh, so we do have Joe Petrowski. I hope I'm saying that right, a research analyst at Parity Technologies. So we're going to touch on Parity, touch on Polkadot. But Joe, I'm going to kick it over to you. Yeah. Hi, good to be here. Cool, man. Well, you told me before the podcast uh, that, you know, you have your own podcast, but you haven't been a guest. So this is your first episode as ever as a guest uh, on any uh, channel. So we're happy to have you. But we're going to touch again on Parity Technologies. We're going to touch on Polkadot. We're going to touch on what you guys are doing with Web3. Uh, but we do want to start off with kind of your, your background before crypto. You were a, uh, you know, a meddled cyclist for the USA, I believe. And uh, I do want to touch on that. So take us through your background before crypto and the lead up to yeah, so uh, I mean, crypto overlaps quite a bit, like several years before I started working at Parity. But uh, my first job after college, uh, I was working at this company called United Launch Alliance, um, and they launched satellites. It was kind of this merger of like Lockheed Martin and Boeing. And so I, st I spent like six years there doing like shock and vibration analysis. So a lot of like finite element modeling and like time series and statistics and uh, just a lot of linear algebra, basically. And then um, and then I left, I went to Europe um, to pursue cycling and I spent like about three years racing in Europe. Um, and yeah, I guess like medaled cyclist, I won uh, a national championship in the US in 2013 in mountain biking, um, which I guess I came to Europe in 2015. So that was a little bit earlier. Um, and then, yeah, after a couple of years of cycling, I was kind of like uh, looking for other stuff to do. And you actually spend a lot of time at home resting when you're cycling. So. Um, I was kind of surfing the, the crypto webs for a couple of years and uh, got into it. And that's when I left cycling, I got into crypto. When you got into crypto, what was the first thing that you, you know, got you into it? Like, what was the first project or uh, that you started in crypto? Yeah, I guess like when I got into it versus like the first project I started were probably like, uh, like three years apart or so. Um, yeah. I, I feel like everybody has this story where like they heard of Bitcoin and then they just, you know, like, didn't sleep for a month. Um, that was <laughs> that was not me at all. Um, like I remember, like kind of learning about it in 2011 or 12, um, and like I was kind of in like like one of my really good friends was friends with Eric Voorhees, and so like I would see him occasionally, and he would tell me what he was working on, and um, like kind of followed it a little bit casually, and like kind of like thought the tech was cool, but didn't really understand the like the bigger picture of it. And then uh, when I moved to Europe and kind of saw the the challenge of like opening a bank account or like even worse, like closing it and trying to get them to give your, your, your money back. Uh, I was like, Oh, maybe this crypto thing makes a little bit of sense. And, uh, so yeah, I mean, the first project I actually started was in 2017 and it was just like in 2016, I had been cycling for a couple of years and wanted to get back into coding and like engineering type stuff. And all of my background was in time series analysis, um, like from vibration and shock stuff. So just started looking to like, you know, you want to refresh yourself with stuff that you know. So I started like playing with some of these algorithms and methods again, uh, but I needed data because like, you know, they don't hand out the uh, satellite data 
to everybody in the world. Um, <laughs> so I just like started looking, like, oh, what could I analyze? And then I was like, oh yeah, you know, like price series, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and all this stuff is, um, is like, you know, there's all these public APIs, you can just go get it. And so started to look a lot more into like, oh, well, like what's actually behind these time series? Like what is Ethereum? You know, what is Litecoin? What is all this stuff? Um, and wrote like a couple trading algorithms that I, I had deployed. Um, and so that was like my main project in like 2016, 2017 was doing that and then got into a little bit of mining, uh, which was a mistake. It's kind of a funny story because I remember like hearing about, um, you know, Bitcoin mining and back in like 2012, they were like, yeah, you have, you have to solve this like complex math problem. And I was like, I solve math problems all day at work. Like <laughs> on the weekend. Um, like I didn't realize that like, you know, they had just mining software, software yeah. all on your laptop. So, um, I think it was like maybe some like I felt like I had missed out or something. So I was like, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna get into mining, and that that was an error. But um, wait, yeah, so, I ended up a parody after that. Yeah, definitely. So you, wait, you, you said that it's a mistake, but you're still doing this mining to this day. This the company's a left mining. Is that am I saying it correctly? Yeah, that's correct. But um, like we kind of, it was it was actually like a really small company. Um, like yeah, and then we've actually kind of stopped because like the price of Ethereum isn't make it work it's worth it so. Gotcha. so from from that minor perspective why was it a mistake i mean a lot of people you know in the space they understand uh the the concept of mining and you know the, the tech behind it and what goes on there but from just like a, a financial perspective or just from from those perspectives why is it tough yeah i mean it's a pretty simple math problem i mean like when you're mining you're basically you're buying uh a token and like in in my case like i was mining ethereum um, you're paying for this token, but instead of like paying, exchanging dollars for it, you're exchanging electricity. Um, and so your goal is that like you spend less on electricity than the actual price of whatever token you mine. Um, and so it's either electricity goes down or the price of the token goes up. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty, uh, cut and dry. Okay. So, so you, you, uh, you mind, uh, Ethereum, only did have you tried Bitcoin as well, or did you go straight to Ethereum only? No, just straight to Ethereum only. Gotcha. And why why did you guys uh, uh, choose uh, Georgia, uh, Tbilisi? Was it because yeah. of the energy costs there? Yeah, I mean, like I was like I looked at a couple countries um, and like did a, like a lot of analyses when I started this, and it came down to like two or three. And honestly, like Georgia, I just had a kind of personal interest. I was like, yeah, that looks good. And I found a data center there um, where the person spoke English. So that's always a plus. And um, yeah, just and I took a trip over there, liked them. And so I went with that. All right. That's, that's, that's a really cool intro story. And, and for the people that, you know, follow this podcast or maybe you're new, we always wait till like 20 minutes in to actually <laughs> dive into what we have you on here for. But so one last question before we get to how you ended up at Parity. Some of us, obviously, that are involved in crypto, uh, you know, haven't you know, seen the ecosystem out there in, in Europe. Like, what would you say the differences are and, and what's something you would tell maybe a U.S. citizen that wants to know what's going on over there uh, as far as blockchain and crypto go? Yeah, so I'm not super in touch with the U.S. scene. I mean, I left America like in late 2014, um, which was way before like the current crypto hype. Um, and I don't really go back that often. But I think like even in Europe, it kind of varies place to place. Like I lived in France for almost four years and in France is very like business focused, um, you know, and like people want to talk about investing or like use cases and applications. And here in Berlin, it's very developer focused. I mean, I've been here a little over a year and like I've never heard anybody talk about the price of a token. It's just like, and there's like, you know, like five meetups a week that you could go to about crypto. And it's just a hundred percent about the tech and what people are developing. Um, yeah, I can't really speak to the differences of the U.S., but um, maybe you guys can compare to that. I think I, I was in uh, Europe uh, only once for like a short meetup in Munich uh, during the Oktoberfest. Um, yeah, it, it was interesting. It wasn't that big of a conference there, so I couldn't really gauge it that much. But yeah, I think, you know, given the time frame, what you said, you haven't come back to U.S. Um, that often, you know, things have definitely changed since the time you've been here. As far as the conferences go and so on but yeah uh that's uh that's awesome let's uh let's hop into uh let's hop into the uh, polka dot can you uh tell us you know just briefly like what it is uh, that you guys are looking to you know establish in the industry yeah so we're looking to establish like a 
a sharded interoperability layer for blockchains. And so, um, you know, the the main thesis behind Polkadot is that there will be a lot of blockchains and a blockchain, like a single blockchain is basically like a single computer. And so, uh, you know, we don't, we have a lot of computers in the world, so it starts to make sense that you have a lot of blockchains um, as long as we think it's a good idea to run certain applications on these blockchains. And so um, they needed an environment to uh, exchange information in, in a trust-free way uh, because you don't just want to have a bunch of blockchains that when they interact with each other, they're like trusting the security of the other blockchain. That kind of defeats the whole purpose. Uh, it puts you back into like the web two model where you are trusting the origin of a message based on who sent it to you. And you have to kind of like analyze, you know, how much do I trust this person or this company or whatever. And so we really wanted to have a layer where different applications could communicate with each other in a trust-free manner. And so Polkadot is the infrastructure to connect them um, in a secure and trust-free manner. Awesome. So we, we kind of skipped over it there for a second. And I do want to touch on, uh, you know, the tech behind Polkadot. How did you end up at Parity Technologies, which is obviously the team that, that created Polkadot. And then we're going to touch on a lot of entities here. You got Web3, you got Polkadot, you got Parity. How do all of these kind of, you know, work together and how do they, how do they interact together on a daily basis? Yeah. So I'll answer the first question first of how I ended up at Parity. Um, I did like kind of hit a point with a lot of my like small like solo companies that I was starting that I was kind of sick of that and wanted, you know, a, a quote unquote real job. And so I started looking around and uh, I had this, I was living in Nice at the time, uh, down south of France. And uh, one of my friends, Katya was like, oh, Berlin is awesome. Like she had just moved from Berlin down to Nice and she was like, Berlin's awesome. You have to go there. Um, and she just like basically like kept, sending me messages on WhatsApp like every day of like different job search websites in Germany. Um, and I just saw like Parity was listed on one of them. I was like, oh yeah, like they made the Ethereum client. Like um, I should check that out. And I started looking and like most, most blockchain positions, they either want like a marketing thing or a core developer or like a PhD researcher. Um, and I'm like none of those things. Like um, I studied aerospace engineering. I'm not like a software engineer, um, you know, and I don't have a PhD. I just have a bachelor's degree. And so I didn't really like fit a lot of stuff. And I saw this position for research analyst and I was like, well, I've been like reading about and studying blockchain for like several years now. And like, I've written a little bit of code. Um, and I just looked and I knew like parody was a, a really well-known and reputable company. So, um, I ended up applying and getting the job. Um, and then, sorry, what was the second question? The question was, you know, just for the people that maybe aren't familiar with the entire parity ecosystem and, and Polkadot ecosystem, like there's a bunch of different entities that kind of work together. You got Web3, you got Parity, you have Polkadot, but how do those all work together for someone that doesn't know uh, about the ecosystem or the relationship at all? Yeah. So like first we can, you know, kind of pull Polkadot and Substrate out of that because Polkadot is the network um, and Substrate is a development framework that we can definitely dive into. Um, which leaves, you know, Web3 Foundation and Parity Technologies. Um, so yeah, Parity is a private company in Berlin um, and Web3 is a nonprofit foundation. And so, yeah, I mean, the, the role of a foundation is to make the protocol successful. Like that's what it's accountable for. It, it has a mission to, you know, further the development of decentralized Web3 technologies. And um, Parity is building Substrate and, you know, is building the actual Polkadot clients. Uh, but there are other companies um, like uh, Chainsafe is building one in Go. And uh, I think it's called Soramitsu is building one in C++. So like Web3 has also hired other companies to build Polkadot clients. Okay, cool. Well, you know, we, you can't really talk about Parity in, in Polkadot without kind of talking about Gavin Wood, right? The, he, the inventor of Solidity, for those of you that don't know, he's pretty much square in the middle of the history of uh, Ethereum and, and, you know, blockchain in general. So who, who kind of is Gavin Wood uh, for those people that don't know? And then how does he interact on a day-to-day -day basis with Parity? Is he, is he super involved? Is he, you know, what is he doing on a day-to-day -day basis essentially? Uh, I, yeah, I mean, like he's coding mostly, <laughs> um, that's what he's mostly doing. Yeah. So, so break that, break his like history down for those people who maybe don't know who Gavin is. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to get myself, uh, <laughs> in, into hot water here, but like, yeah, I mean like Gav, um, started Ethereum back in like 2014, I think, um, 
when he met Vitalik, um, started working on like a C++ client and uh, wrote the yellow paper and the spec for the EVM. Um, and then like left the Ethereum Foundation uh, to start Parity. And then, uh, I mean, we've been working on like Ethereum and Polkadot for a while now. Um, and yeah, I mean, Gavage is just like coding a lot of, a lot of the time and um, is like quite involved. He's in the office a lot. So. Awesome. Well, obviously Polkadot and, and all of everything that you guys are building is, is definitely related to something that you touched on earlier, which is interoperability and having the ability to, for, you know, developers to easily create uh, applications and have all the features, uh, all the pro features and not all the con features that we've seen over the last couple of years. So kind of break down the pros and cons of, of the consensus mechanisms that you've seen be created since you know 2015 2016 being a research analyst you have a, a ton of information on all of this so kind of where you see the first iteration uh of these blockchain technologies and, and where you see that going in the future yeah so i mean there's two parts to it you know there's the the blockchain technology in general and then there's consensus consensus we haven't seen a ton of innovation on like the proof of work side except just uh you know creating different hashing algorithms or you know different proof of work metric to make it, you know, non ASIC friendly or a certain ASIC friendly. Um, and so, which kind of goes to show like the importance of shared security, because if you, if you have two networks, then they just start competing for hash power or electricity. And so the security of a proof of work network is related to how much hash power is behind it. And so every time you add another proof of work network, that just gets more diluted. And so uh, if you want to have multiple chains interacting with each other, there has to be some notion of how they can, like a primitive for how they can share security. Um, and then the other part of like blockchain development, uh, like this is where we're really pushing with Substrate, is that most blockchain protocols come out with like a fresh client or that they just built from scratch. And so there's so much to actually building a client that is not actually the blockchain, right? So like a blockchain is you have some database and like if you wanna take like a really simple example, it could be like an Excel spreadsheet um, and then you have a block, which is a list of updates to it. And then you have a new, like a new database. And so that the logic of like how, what you're allowed to change in that database is what makes a blockchain unique. So like, that's, what's a theory, that's, what's different about Ethereum versus Zcash versus Bitcoin. And so there's all this other stuff that goes into a client though, like building a database, building networking, uh, a transaction queue, you know, how do you put transactions into this block, uh, RPCs. CLI interfaces. And so what we're really trying to do is to like to make this, make it so you can just focus on what are the, what kind of information are you storing and what are the rules for how you modify or manipulate or add or remove that information. And proof of stake uh, as being the consensus mechanism. Uh, what do you see there, you know, in terms of like some of the issues that they're dealing with and, you know, perhaps what you guys are going to be looking to do a little bit different to fix like, certain concentration of power that kind of destabilizes decentralization, you know, in, the, in a proof of stake environment. Yeah. So in a proof of stake network, uh, you know, the security of the network is related to how much value is at stake and also, you know, who controls that value. And so, you know, one of the things we're doing to prevent centralization is just to have uh, an adaptive slashing mechanism. And so we actually say, you know, um, the more people who commit a certain offense at a certain time, the slash actually goes up. So it might be like, um, you know, the percentage of people who have committed this to some power or time some multiple, depending on what the offense is. So I think like for being offline, you know, it's like the percentage times 0 0.01. Um, whereas for like equivocation, you know, double signing a block, then it's the percentage tie like raised to some power. Uh, and so and they're all kind of made so that once you get up to 33% of the network doing something wrong, it's like a hundred percent slash. So you're just completely removed. And so yes, certain actors can obtain like more control of the network, uh, but they also take on a lot more risk at a, at a much higher rate than control that they're getting. So like their rewards might increase linearly as they, as they increase how many validators they're running. Uh, but, their actual slashing risk, un risk unless they're running truly decentralized infrastructure uh, that has completely independent failures, um, or if they just try to do a, a purposely malicious attack, then they're looking at like actually much higher slashing penalty than linear. 
Got it. So break down this terminology of, of uh, parachains, because I've seen obviously a bunch of, a bunch of you uh, in a couple interviews on YouTube talking about this idea of parachains and how that makes uh, the blockchain exponentially more scalable in, in that sense. And I hate to use that term because I feel like it's thrown around a bunch in, in crypto today, but ex- just kind of break down parachains and how this tech will work for Polkadot. Yeah. So I mean, parachains are the the blockchains that are being connected by the relay chain and Polkadot. And so they can each have their own custom logic. The the really important thing for Polkadot is that they just have a state transition function that can compile to Wasm and they provide an execute block function. So when a parachain changes state, it's going to get validators from the relay chain and like they will submit a block for the validator to execute and make sure that it follows the state transition rules of that parachain. And so I think like to answer this question of how they improve scalability, we can zoom out a little bit first and talk about like who's involved in Polkadot and like what are the different nodes. And so we have this relay chain and it has validators. And so the parachains don't have any validators at all. Um, They only have what's called collators who are responsible for like compiling and submitting these blocks. And so, and they submit some other stuff too, like um, egress messages and state routes and um, like a tree of the stuff that they've actually changed in this block. Um, I and mean, we can kind of dive into that if you want, but like they're providing all the necessary information to the Polkadot validators in order to verify that this block follows the state transition rules of their own parachain. And so um, each one has its own, you have these like, yeah, each, sorry, I'll start, start that part over, but like um, each parachain has its own state transition function. Um, that can be validated by Polkadot as long as it follows, um, as long as it provides an execute block function in WebAssembly. And so kind of like what this changes is that uh, each parachain has like zero responsibility for its own security. All of the security is coming from the relay chain because um, when it submits this block and proof that it's been validly executed, um, it creates what's called a candidate receipt. And this is what actually goes into the relay chain itself. And so the blocks on the relay chain are made up of candidate receipts from the parachains. Um, you could really quickly just think of them as like block headers. So it, it has like the state root and the like a pointer to the last block of each parachain. And so these all go in the relay chain. So in order to roll back a single parachain, like if you wanted to cause a reorg on a single parachain, you'd have to roll back all of Polkadot. And so, mm-hmm. um, yeah, the parachain, the, like, this is where the scalability comes from because you don't have to provide your own security on a parachain. Got it. Okay. So that kind of plays into this idea of, of states and, and finality. And, you know, when we first decided to do this interview, we kind of were just jumping into to deep water, right? Like we're, we're not developers, you know, no, uh, we have our, our guy who's in house, but obviously the guy, us doing this interview, we're not developers. So it kind of explain uh, how states and finality play into kind of what someone would see on the front or someone wouldn't see on the front end. So what are the, what's the importance of states? What's the importance of finality when it comes to just blockchain in general and how, uh, you know, I think you guys said you, you use grandpa as a tool there. So you can touch on that when you, when you do touch on finality. Yeah. So, I mean, a state is just like a configuration, right? Um, and so computers are all finite state machines. They have a certain number of configurations they can be in. It happens to be, a very large finite number, but uh, it is finite. And so um, like at the most basic level of state, you know, you can think of a light switch, it's either on or off, that's its state. Um, And then you could have rules for, you know, if somebody says, hey, turn that light switch off, well, you could have some sort of logic to decide, should I actually turn this light switch off? And um, so that is like the state and the state transition function. And then finality is like, if you see something on the front end uh, that says, you know, at this block, this block is final and it has this state, you should never see that block number again with a different state, um, which would be a reorganization. So um, this can happen in probabilistic finality networks like proof of work, where you can actually get a chain reorged by several blocks um, and in proof of stake, um, or well, you could actually put like a, a finality gadget on top of proof of work because proof of work is really about how you select who's the next author to add something to a chain. Um, and proof of stake is kind of the same way, but you can decide to add a finality gadget on top of that that says, you know, hey, once this block is final, um, you would actually need a hard fork to revert it. 
I wanted to touch a little bit more on um, the validators you mentioned uh, earlier. Um, so you already have uh, certain like nodes set up already uh, that are doing validating for your testnet, or you know, or are you looking you know to still build out more nodes uh, for the upcoming uh, mainnet launch? Um, and and kind of if you could briefly describe maybe. Um, what's the requirement there you know to to be a node basically for uh for the network yeah so like we have a lot of people running validators on kusama i think there's like 150 or 160 validators right now um i mean like the technical requirements pretty low i think like you know like two cores eight gigs of ram 100 gigs of storage something like this um and then you know, there are some like fancy architecture stuff you can do, like century nodes and everything. But like, if you're talking like a bare minimum, you just really need a computer running uh, that's connected <laughs> to the network. Um, and then as far as like staking requirements, um, yeah, so we have this concept of like a stash and a, and a controller account um, so that you can like kind of configure your validator and change the settings, whatever. And um, we use a selection algorithm called nominated proof of stake. And so people can like, if you don't want to run a validator, which if, you know, most people don't, uh, then you can just select up to 16 validators who you trust uh, and would like to run on your behalf. And so uh, we have this pretty cool algorithm called fragments. Uh, it comes from like a, like a late 1800s paper that this guy wrote um, about like voting algorithms. Um, and it basically figures out, you know, you have this huge list of people who have nominated up to 16 uh, validators and then this va list of validators and when you nominate um, so like in most delegated proof of stake networks you're gonna say like hey I'm gonna delegate you know a hundred tokens to this validator and uh, you know 150 to this one and 20 to this one um, you don't do that in nominated proof of stake you say you know I have a hundred tokens that I've locked up and these are 16 validators who I find acceptable that I want to, to validate on my behalf and what Fragment will do is it'll go through all the combinations of how it could arrange these uh, stakes. And first it'll optimize to find like, how, how can we get the most value at stake in the network? And then it'll optimize, how can we make this the most evenly distributed? So we want like the maximum stake validator to actually be as low as possible. And we want the minimum stake validator to be as high as possible um, because we don't want the minimum stake validator to commit some offense. Um, so we want them to have as much value at stake as possible. So we really want to have like an evenly staked validator set. Um, and on top of just like the fragment optimization, we do have like our incentive structure is set up to, to have that where you would nominate people who have less already nominated behind them. So is, is there some type of DAO that's set up to kind of uh, talk about the relationships between all these nodes when you're talking about governance? Um, like between which nodes? So uh, how, do, how do all the nodes interact with each other as far as like carrying out governance on the network? Yeah, so I mean, governance is completely separate from validation in Polkadot. Um, like I know some other networks they'll kind of do like, um, the validators will assume some governance power uh, based on who's delegating to them um, or just extra inherently. Uh, in Polkadot, it's completely separate. So um, we have like quite a complex governance structure uh, just because it's a, complex system and so we need different avenues to recover from failures or to make upgrades to the protocol um so even though there are different avenues the at the end of the day over 50 like if you have 50 percent of the tokens you can always control the network basically um so we have this idea of a council which is a collection of you know i think like 13 members right now on kusama um but of course like the number can change by governance um and so you know, they can kind of like fast track or like fast track a referendum um, to go through or like change the voting threshold of like what would be required from, from the full public referendum on that. Um, and then we have like a technical committee. So um, if there's like an emergency network upgrade that we need to do, uh, they can actually push something through in a little bit shorter time than the mm -hmm. regular council. So um, we also have this idea of like an enactment period. So you know, most proof of stake networks have a um, like an unbonding period. So if you're a staker, if you're a validator, you have to wait, you know, some number of days before you can get your stake back after you're done staking. Um, you know, in case they discover that you've done anything, you know, malicious that they just didn't catch in real time. Um, so we also have an enactment period, which that is like a couple days longer than the unbonding period. So if some governance referendum goes through that you don't like, 
um, you can always just say like, hey, I'm gonna quit and like unbond and you can leave before this thing gets enacted. Yeah, I feel like governance is something that everyone is kind of trying to figure out and, and I kind of want to break that down and wonder uh, how those committees are actually chosen and then how they're kind of uh, worked through on a rolling basis. Like how are there, are there new members added or are, are the, is the you know number of members going to increase over time? Uh, so I guess you could break that down and then uh, just one of the key features uh, as far as substrate goes is this ability to be forkless. I think if you can go into that uh, after you touch on kind of that governance issue uh, there. Yeah, sure. So like, I guess like the main bodies we can touch on are the technical committee and the council. So membership in the technical committee is like pretty clear cut. Um, I think it's, if you if you've implemented a Polkadot client, um, or if you've implement or if you've created like a specification for it, and so um, I think like Parity and the Web Three Foundation, um, and then like one of the Polkadot uh, implementers will be like the first members of the technical committee. Um, the council, yeah, it does have like the the elections are on a rolling basis. So um, I think you know every couple of days. So on Kusama, we sped up a lot of things. Like Kusama is basically four times faster than Polkadot, um, whereas like an era in Polkadot is 24 hours and an era in Kusama is six hours. Uh, so all of this stuff is like kind of happening really fast on Kusama. D define an era. Yeah. So um, in staking, like. So one of the things to have the deterministic finality is you need to know the size of the validator set. So in uh, like a proof of work, you never really know the size of the hash power because there could be hidden hash power. People can always kind of come and go as they please. Um, and to have deterministic finality, you have to know how many validators are and you say like, okay, like for this time period, this is the list of validators and there, you know, there's 200 of them. And this is like, these, this is who they are. And if they leave, they get punished and nobody else can really join. And so, uh, but of course we don't want the same, you know, number of validators, the same actors to be there forever. They should be held accountable and have to like continually justify their existence as a validator. And so an era is just this time period that we have and every era there's an election um, and rewards are also calculated for an era. So if you complete the era as a validator, you'll get some rewards for that, um, but you're also up for election every single era. Um, and a new validator set is decided. Got it. So you were kind of touching on before I asked about the error, you were kind of touching on it rolling on a six hour or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, six hour basis and a 24 hour basis. So w who is actually involved in these governance councils now? Does, would it be names that we know? Uh, did, like how does this all work as far as the governance committee goes? Yeah. So on the council, I think most of the names are actually like listed on chain. Um, cause we have this like neat little identity module, uh, that you can like register all of your information. Um, and so, yeah, I mean like Gav's on it, Youth is on it. Um, like a lot of our community members, uh, like Shevdor is on it. Uh, I, like, I don't remember everybody on the list off the top of my head, but um, yeah, I mean, I think like everybody just has publicly made themselves known as a council member. And then, yeah, the, the adjustments are uh, rolling. So like, you know, every day or week or something, one of these seats is up for re-election and it gets recalculated. Um, and then, yeah, and then they can like, kind of like push these runtime upgrades um, into like a public referendum. Got it, okay. And then I guess this, well, Dima, did you have one question before? No, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. no, I guess the second part of that, uh, that I, you know, did add there in the end, of, uh, which I probably shouldn't have as an interviewer, but uh, when we're talking about uh, being forkless and the idea of being upgradable and adaptable, uh, how does that kind of work itself uh, into what you guys are doing at Polkadot? Yeah, so that was a really big design consideration early on that we've built around. Um, and it's really important because, um, so I was like, I was talking to one of my colleagues actually earlier today uh, who studied linguistics and he was talking about, you know, you have extinct languages, which just nobody speaks anymore. And then you have dead languages, which people speak, but there's no native speaker. So this would be like Latin. And so they never really changed. It's just Latin is Latin. Um, and then you have living languages that people are actually native speakers of. And so um, this is really important when it comes to computer languages and computer software, because um, you know, computers can only really understand what's in a computer. It doesn't understand that there is an outside world. Um, and of course, the information that people want to put in computers changes, like the way we interact with each other changes, the 
the information available to us, the stuff that we want, and like just computer power grows. So we get other stuff that we were like, hey, we could kind of like put that on a computer if we just found a way to encode it in the, the proper structure. And so um, we want to keep we want to keep this as living software, right? And there are there is lots of dead software. I mean, how many like servers out there are running on Windows NT or something, right? Like there is such a thing as like dead software that like exists, but like it doesn't really change and you know it's just kind of there. Um, and then there's like living software, and we really want this to be living software that can continue to evolve um, as the demands for it change. And so um, that that's what was like. That's why it's really important to have this forkless upgrade feature because it's like, I mean, you look at hard forks and other networks and it's a huge pain. Like um, if, if you have the governance process in place to decide like, hey, we should do this upgrade, it shouldn't really be up to like a bunch of other people to decide like, nah, I don't, don't want to update my node, right? Um, it should just be on chain and autonomous and happen. So that was like our motivation for doing it. Um, and then like, one of the things that makes it really easy is that we have this like extra, like I don't want to call it extra, I guess, but like this abstraction layer um, called the runtime. And so this is where you list like all of the parameters and can add custom modules. And so like, um, you know, we don't just, you know, like substrate comes with all these modules, uh, we call them palettes, but you don't just like pull those in to your main function and say like, yeah, okay, like I'm using these, just go. Um, we have this extra layer kind of between those modules and the actual executable, which is the runtime where you can set like, hey, I want to configure, um, you know, how long an era is, or I want to configure like how many council members there are or something like this. Um, or you could just add like a whole new module at that layer. And so you can actually change that like in a forkless fashion. So if you want to say like, if you want to put in a, a referendum that says, hey, um, you know, I think there should be 300 validators and not 200. Um, it's just a parameter change in this runtime and it can just be deployed and enacted aut autonomously. What are you kind of plans and s strategies to attract the uh, like high value developers to build uh, on uh, Polkadot? You know, once you guys are, you know, launching and then what, what's kind of the area that you're looking to target in terms of, you know, we'll, um, some of the applications that are going to be built on the network, you know, do you have a specific focus around that area? Yeah, so um, should also highlight like we have a lot of people who are like really like awesome teams who are already building on Substrate and Polkadot. Um, and then we just launched this Substrate Builders program where we offer like technical technical help so like people can come in and like work with our developers um, and then like biz, biz dev and marketing support as well. Um, and then we're also going to like keep building on it ourselves. You know, like we have our core team who's working on the relay chain. Um, but we're going to be working on parachains and everything as well. Um, like we don't just leave that, you know, out there for, you know, let's, we don't want to just make the relay chain and say, well, like, Hey, okay. Like we made it. Uh, <laughs> um, no, like we're going to continue to like build this and, and help it evolve. And I think like one of the really cool parachains that we're building is like Polkadot itself, um, which sounds kind of crazy, but like, you know, I kind of mentioned earlier that you put these candidate receipts from parachains into the relay chain block. Um, but we also have this other stuff like the staking and like balance transfers um, and like governance decisions that are going through the relay chain. And we really want to like push as much to the edges as possible, right? Like we don't want this relay chain to be a bottleneck. And so um, our goal is to actually make it that uh, the relay chain only contains parachain receipts. And so there would actually be a parachain for governance and a parachain for staking and a parachain mm. for balance transfers. Um, and it just like puts everything outside of the center. Um, and just like the, I mean, we can talk about like the cross chain messaging protocol a little bit, like if you guys want, but like the whole idea is that this stuff happens outside of the relay chain and you just kind of like prove that it's correct with like a hash that goes into the relay chain. Um, and then there was another part of this question that I was going into. Um, oh, yeah. So like, as far as like applications um, that we see like being built on it, um, I mean, like it can go a lot of directions, but so Polkadot is kind of like infrastructure for infrastructure. Like we're talking about like a blockchain that helps blockchains communicate with each other. So like the next like round of blockchains is stuff like stablecoin or decentralized exchange or smart contract platform that it's not really an application itself, right? Like it's something that 
other blockchains would use as part of their application. And so I think we'll see like not just application specific blockchains, but blockchain applications that don't have a blockchain, right? Like you could design an application that's using like a stable coin and like an IPFS storage chain um, and like some identity thing and like some smart contract to like verify something. Um, and the application doesn't have a blockchain itself. It's just using blockchain for all of its services. Mm. So I think like, that's something that I'll be, that's maybe a couple of years out, but like not just like runtime composability, but like blockchain composability. Yeah. And I think that process can't really get taken out or carried out right now because of how hard it is to do all those things. So, so no one that can create a regular application is going to say, Hey, I kind of really want to build on, you know, blockchain because it's so easy. No, we haven't gotten to that point, but let's talk on some of those teams that you, you uh, kind of alluded to there. Uh, Sutler ventures, the team behind layer one uh, took part in that uh, lock drop that was on edgeware. Uh, you know, I, I actually took part myself in a Kusama uh, call. I, I wouldn't even know what you would call it at that point, but kind of like a community call of sorts. So kind of break down uh, Edgeware and maybe a couple other platforms that are building on Polkadot that you think are interesting. Yeah, so Edgeware is developing like a smart contract platform and a bunch of governance tools. Uh, I think they're set to, to relaunch sometime in the next couple of months. Uh, I'm not really aware of the details, to be honest. Um, and then like some other teams that I think are really exciting, like we have the Substrate TEE. Um, so it's, they're running Substrate in uh, like Intel SGX. Um, and they're working on some like really cool stuff like um, actually, so there's this concept of like remote signing for validators where like you keep your keys on HSM um, and you would like send your, your payloads to this to sign. Um, but this doesn't like an HSM is kind of like a dummy Oracle, right? It just like signs whatever you give it. Um, and so they're working on like a light client that would work inside of SGX and it could actually like validate that it's signing something correct. Um, but it would still be like remote to the nodes. So it'd be completely offline. Um, so I think like that's really cool. Um, and then like we have this team, Robonomics, um, who's building an interface from Substrate to robot operating system, which I guess is just like as someone who used to work on like physical hardware um, and get to like touch things, then like I think that's cool. Like they're like integrating a blockchain with robots and um, you can like actually like do something on the blockchain and then see something happen in the real world. Um, and then like we have like a bunch of teams like uh, Staked is building some layer two stuff. Um, we have a couple other teams building layer two applications and then Laminar uh, based in Asia, they're building like a, a whole suite of DeFi protocols on top of Substrate. Really cool. We, we, uh, I'm going to step in front of Dima here because I know he wants to ask about uh, this because he's, he's our resident kind of guy that's really interested into the, into the, you know, value accrual on tokens. So obviously you have, uh, you know, that dot token and, and you're talking about this relay chain and how you're going to have a, a ton of different pair chains that then signal back to this relay chain. And, and I kind of want to break down how the dot token works in all of this. And then how does value accrue within that token? I mean, like in a proof of stake network, like, the value or the security of the network is related to the value of the token. And so, um, you know, I think like the primary, the primary use of this token would be governance, right? Um, that you can like have a voice in how this network operates and upgrades. Um, and then also like as a utility for a parachain slot. So like there's uh, like parachain slots are limited uh, because the validators have to go validate each one. Um, can't just like have a million parachain slots, at least at the beginning. Um, but like in order to have a parachain, you have to bond tokens for, you know, six months, to two years um, in order to have access to that slot. So, um, and then same, like we have this concept of a para thread, which is like a pay as you go parachain. So like a parachain, um, this can execute a block, like every block of the relay chain, whereas a para thread, it has to like bid on every block. So um, there's actually like a lot of really good applications for para threads. Um, but yeah, like that would be the value proposition for them is that like, that's why a dot token is valuable because it's getting a finality and security guarantee from being part of Polkadot. Yeah, that's, that's super interesting because, you know, you mentioned that lockup period there, six to 12 months, um, which is, you know, we talk about, uh, different networks and how they take out basically the tokens out of the circulating supply to prevent like, you know, some of the volatility that we've seen prices and tokens um, where, you know, they get dumped on the market or whatnot, you know. So that definitely adds to stability, you know, uh, as far as your price of a token goes. You were planning to launch the mainnet in Q4 or uh, 
2019, uh, if I'm correct. And uh, it got pushed a little bit uh, to Q1 2020. Where are you guys at right now? And, you know, why was it pushed? Yeah, so, um, I mean, we're like really close to actually launching. Um, we're in some like final, final audits and testing of the software, um, fixing like a few final issues. Um, but I mean, as far as like why it was pushed, I mean, we, you know, we released this idea in like late 2016 um, with kind of like a three year timeline to build it. Um, and just, yeah, I mean, it's not like we were just, this isn't like a software thing where you spec out something and then you just have to like go write the code for it. Like a lot of the stuff that we're doing is completely new. It, like we don't have a solution to this. We don't know what it looks like. Um, and so a lot of it you just have to figure out and it's not really something that you can say like, oh, this will take us a month to do. It might take you a week and it might take you six months, but um, you kind of like add up a bunch of those problems and like actually a couple of months, like a one quarter slip on a three year timeline of doing something that's like completely new. Um, I think that's actually like, it's pretty small compared to other stuff that I've seen in engineering. Yeah, definitely. You guys, you got, go ahead, Dima, sorry. Yeah, I was going to ask you just one more question uh, on top of that. Are you guys doing, uh, are you using any like third party auditing firms um, to, to kind of, you know, go through that stuff to make sure everything is, you know, is squeaky clean? Yeah, I think we have five third party audit firms. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Got it. Well, you know, you guys are obviously doing a lot of cool things. What, uh, you know, you kind of talked on, on the past history there and kind of the genesis of Polkadot and, and the idea and the, the, the kind of the start of creating this whole network that has come to fruition. But let, let's talk one year. Let's talk two years. What do you expect to see uh, on the Polkadot network? I know you talked about like a, a couple applications, but let's let's say best case scenario a year from now. What will we be talking about on Polkadot? Yeah, I mean, a year from now, I'd really like to see a thousand validators uh, for one, um, because that's what really gives us like the power to add parachains. Um, so we think we can do this with about ten validators per parachain. So um, ten val or a thousand validators gives us enough for a hundred parachains. Um, I don't think there will be a hundred parachains in one year. That's pretty ambitious. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would love to see like a like a good set of infrastructure in a year. So like um, running smoothly on a thousand validators, like we had some like grandpa hiccups on Kusama, um, which was really valuable to work out some bugs there. Um, and then, but it would be great to see like a stable coin chain, a smart contract chain, a bridge to Ethereum, a bridge to Bitcoin. Um, maybe we can like move out the, um, like all the token stuff from Polkadot out of the relay chain. Um, I don't know if that's, like within a year and then to really like solidify our cross chain messaging protocol and get some standards in there. Um, because we do just have like, we do have like a, a repo for polka dot standards proposals. Um, but cross chain message passing is just sending like arbitrary bytes. So you can just send like any kind of information between chains. And so coming up with a format for certain types of messages, like, um, you know, of course you can send any message, but a lot of chains are going to want to send tokens to each other or something, mm -hmm. right? So like locking down some standards for this. Um, I think we have this uh, this idea called Spree, which is uh, shared protected runtime execution enclave, um, which is like, it's a backronym, but it's a, uh, Spree is a river that goes through Berlin. So a little fun uh. there. Um, <laughs> but uh, like, I think like Spree is going to be part of this formatting and like standard messages because it, it really provides some extra guarantees on top of the cross chain messages. So I think just a lot, getting like a lot more infrastructure and in, having a really solid validator community. Um, and then just like having the standards for how these chains interact, that'll go a long way towards getting, you know, the two year vision or two or three year vision of getting some like next level application and developer tooling because it's really hard to make developer tooling when like the interface changes, you know, every month or something, right? Like, how are you going to build a tool for that? And so I think just getting a lot of the stuff to stabilize um, and get more of the infrastructure chains in place, that'll be like really big towards getting some more like complex or user facing applications in a couple of years. Gotcha. So we touched on Kusama for a 
couple conversations that we had previously, but uh, kind of break down how Kusama works. Cause it, the way that I kind of, you know, uh, visualize it in my head, it's kind of this like scout that you would send forward and, you know, kind of look at the area. Maybe, maybe the area is a little dangerous. You want to check it out. You don't want to obviously have your, your main force there uh, checking that out. So explain the importance of Kusama. Cause I, I love the branding behind it as well. And I would love for you to kind of go into it. Yeah. Like our team has done an awesome job on the branding for sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, Kusama, that's actually like a pretty good analogy, like a scout going up front. Um, this poor, unfortunate scout died a couple of times, but um, <laughs> <laughs> the nice thing about computer programs is you can restart them. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was like, this was before we started our code audit. So it was just an unaudited release of Polkadot with all of the major features that we wanted to have at Polkadot launch. Um, we actually might even scale back a little bit for Polkadot because we really want like the relay chain to be um, like as bare bones, like critical infrastructure as possible. So like we have this idea of account indices, right? It's like a short form of an address. Um, we, I think like we might actually take that out of Polkadot mainnet um, just because it's like we don't, we don't really like need it there, right? It's not critical. Um, so Kusama was just like a great place to get get stuff out there and get people playing with all of the functionality that we have and see what breaks. And like a lot of stuff broke and led to some really good improvements and optimizations. So uh, some of the competitors, you know, that like Cosmos, for example, you know, have you guys observed any challenges that they had, you know, when they entered the market, um, when they launched the mainnet and, have, you know, have you learned anything from, from, from them um, when, you know, building out uh, your network and how you guys want to do things? Yeah, I mean, like, like I watched them a little bit, um, but not in a super detailed way. Uh, one thing, like, that's definitely interesting is, like, in Cosmos, you know, they pass on their governance authority to validators. Like, if, if you delegate to someone and then you don't vote in a referendum, that gets passed on to the validator into their voting power. And so we've seen, like, a lot of validators actually have 0% commission just to, like, accumulate more delegation and have more governance power. Um, and then like they had a few upgrades that had issues, but um, I mean, like, to be fair, I mean, upgrading blockchains is not easy, um, but like further motivation for our forkless upgrades. Um, yeah, I mean, like we just thought really hard about our validation stuff, uh, like validation logic and staking logic and governance logic um, in order to have like really thorough governance processes to be able to change the system if we realize that something is going wrong and then a like a staking system that is secure and um distributes stake in an even way um so like one of these one thing for example is like in cosmos um and i think like actually all delegated proof of stake networks is that your voting power is related to how much stake you have behind you so if you have if your validator has 10% of the stake behind it, then it just has 10% of the vote. And so, you know, you usually need to have two thirds threshold um, in order to make something final. Um, and so, but in Polkadot, we don't do that. Like every validator just gets one vote. And so if you could have, you know, you could have 10% of the stake, but if there are 200 validators, it doesn't matter. You still only get half a percent of the voting power. Um, and so we really want to like spread that as thin as possible. It doesn't really, it actually reduces your rewards to nominate somebody who has a lot of stake behind them because their rewards are still, they're equivalent to how many blocks they're producing or how many finality justifications they're making, not their actual stake. And so you actually get a lot more like return on capital to have your tokens behind a low stake validator. Nice. Yeah, that, that's super important. We've seen that, you know, it's, these type of issues come up in, in other networks for sure. Uh, I think one of the other issues that comes up a lot also is just the participation of, um, you know, nodes or, uh, you know, the council that's making decisions in terms of uh, making upgrades or changes to the network or involving the community, you know, to participate in voting for certain changes it has been a struggle as well, you know, because people... You know, they 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 don't see kind of the incentive there. Maybe um, you know we we can obviously talk about the incentive because hey, you are protecting the network, and eventually you know that will value the um, the tokens and the stake, you know, and so on. Um, but um, you know, some people don't really participate because they don't see that link there. Uh, am I kind of describing it right? You know, what what's you do? You guys having some kind of uh, way to push these participations? You know, um, uh, from from nodes to 
take action, you know, when, when it's needed on certain um, decisions um, on change. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, like, you can't make people vote, right? Like, right, <laughs> yeah. So, like, that's, that was a lot of motivation for the council. Um, and, like, the council is there to kind of speak for minority share, like, minority participants or people who just don't participate that much. And so, as a counselor, you actually have to show up and vote. And so, um, if you you know, if you abstain from a certain number of referenda, then you just get booted from the council, like kind of automatically. Um, and so we expect that like the counselors have a responsibility to be there voting um, on these proposals. And then um, when stuff passes like unanimously from the council, it has a much lower threshold in the public referendum to actually pass. Um, and so the council's kind of there to speak for these people who don't come out to vote so much. Um, and of course, if they're not happy with the council, then that would be the time to come out and actually to vote and, and change that. Um, and then, you know, as these, so we use something called adaptive quorum biasing in the like public referendum. Um, and that is like, you have a threshold that starts, it could either be really low or high, depending on whether it's positive or negative bias. But like, as you approach 100% turnout, the threshold always converges to 50%. So if 100% of the token holders show up, then 50% can always like make a decision. Um, but if only 20% show up, then the threshold might be like 40% to pass as long as it's been unanimously approved by the council. And so um, this allows, this kind of prevents like a whale from tipping an election in the public mm -hmm. unless they're in the council. Yeah, so we kind of alluded to it earlier, but you know, governance is something that everyone's trying to figure out. And you guys certainly have your own processes here with this committee and the way that uh, voting is done uh, through the validators. Have you had any issues up to this point with with any type of uh, kind of black swan event or you know something something happening and, and maybe the governance not working uh, to to what you guys thought? Um, I don't think the governance part has ever broken um yeah actually not that i can think of on the governance side we did have like we did have one time we had to hard fork kusama um because there was a bug and now like off the top of my head i can't remember what actually happened but um yeah we oh yeah we do i do remember we finalized something that uh actually like bricked the runtime and so we did have to hard fork okay get everybody to upgrade um and roll back like five blocks or something um and restart from there which that at that point, like you have to go outside of governance because like governance is on chain, and if the chain is not progressing, then you can't do it. Got um, it. So the only governance failure was not actually governance failure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it seems th these processes are seem to be incredibly com complex. But let's talk about like a, a from a user perspective. So someone listening to this or, or watching it on YouTube uh, is interested in Polkadot. Where are they going to maybe create a wallet? Like, what what does that process look like? Yeah, so we have like a lot of different key generation and wallet utilities. Um, the most popular is definitely Polkadot.js um, that, you know, Yako is the primary maintainer of. Um, and then like we have some like command line tools, like if somebody's into that, um, Substrate comes with this thing called subkey. So you can generate keys uh, from your command line. And like if you're running a validator, maybe you will have like, uh, like an air gapped machine or something like this. And then something like that would be interesting to you. Uh, but for most users, yeah, there's um, there's Polka.js, and then there's a couple other, I think, like Enzyme and Polka Wallet, and um, uh, Polka Stats, I think, might have a wallet, but I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, <laughs> hope I'm not uh, false advertising there. But um, yeah, I mean, there's a few options. We use, you know, ED25519 and SR25519 cryptography, and we also support, like, the uh, the uh, Bitcoin curve, the... Uh, was a SecP 256K1. Um, so those addresses are compatible as well. So right now, like Polkadot.js is the primary one to go. Um, and you can just, you know, there's literally like add accounts. It'll generate a key for you, a, put in a password. It gives you like a backup JSON. Um, and we also have like the Polkadot.js extension, which is really user-friendly and um, just hooks right into where, wherever you'd submit a Polkadot transaction. Awesome. Well, you know, we knew going in that this was going to be one of our most complex interviews. And I think we did a good job kind of, uh, well, we did, I think we did a good job of breaking down <laughs> Polka, Polkadot and, and Substrate and all the different pair of threads that are being created uh, on Polkadot at this time. So 
let's let's like zoom out a little bit and uh, I did have one question that was in the dashboard that uh, you can maybe touch on I know it's Gavin's words but I think that you can maybe give some light there and, and it kind of like gives an overall view of why polka dot even exists today uh, I think it was from a 2017 article Gav was talking about web 3.0 and obviously that alludes to why web three has its name in general uh, but it, it was talking about how the internet is this kind of quote unquote big baby and that it it's it's gotten older but it hasn't grown up and what does that mean to you as like a research analyst and what what do you think Gavin was talking about there yeah well I don't want to claim uh access to Gav's thoughts because uh <laughs> yeah, I mean he thought of that and yeah. was way ahead of the rest of us um so but yeah I mean like web two and web one it doesn't really give you a ton of rights right I mean they like if you want to do something, you have to kind of ask permission from somebody else. And so um, even though the web provided a new way for us to interact with each other, um, it really didn't change like a lot of the foundational parts of society, right? Like, um, yes, you have a new way to access your bank account, but you still have a bank account, right? It didn't really change that. And so, um, yeah, it just kind of imposed like the normal societal structures like uh, I mean, the state and corporations and all of the natural patterns that they follow in power accumulation um, into the web. And so Polkadot is hopefully something that will change that paradigm and uh, let users grow up for themselves. You know, this, this kind of reminds me of uh, crypto where, you know, you, you have like your own keys and everything, right? And you have the ability to own your own uh, coins and stuff and hold it on your own wallet. But yet people, you know, still hold it on like exchanges and whatnot, right? On these centralized, uh, with these centralized entities that hold their private keys, right? So it's kind of like going, you know, in, in, in that full circle, like you mentioned, uh, you know, with the banks in the internet, right? And then in crypto, this happens too, where, you know, people could really use it um, in the safest way, or they can choose to, you know, maybe hold it somewhere on the exchange that third party will have their keys, right? Um, so that reminds me of it. Yeah, but like, so blockchain developments, like if you compare it to the arc of the web, we're probably around like 1992, like pre Netscape days. Right. And, um, yeah, it's not friendly at all to like hold your own keys and be responsible yeah. for that. I mean, that it's hard. Um, and I like, I think the, the user experience will grow a lot and I'm kind of like personally anti-education on a lot of this stuff. Like I know, um, I mean, if somebody wants to get educated, then they should, absolutely have the resources and be able to find out this information. I mean, that's part of like the web three ethos is that like, if you want to know how something works, it's open, you can go discover it. It's transparent. Um, but a lot of people don't want to know how this stuff works. Like they just want to use it. Right. right and right. Um, if you, if you're, if your strategy to adoption is to teach everybody about public private key cryptography, you're going to lose, like mm. it's just not going to happen. And I would even say this is a negative, like um, if, if you start teaching people what a private key is, then hackers will try to exploit that and get them to give it away and like convince them that it's not really that important. So I think like, or I hope that we see a lot of innovation in user experience and that people can use blockchain and crypto without even knowing like what a private key is and it just works, but yet they're still retaining the actual control. Um, I'm not a UX designer. I don't know how it's going to, how that will manifest, but, um, yeah, I, I don't think it's a viable path to just try to teach everybody what this stuff is. And not only that, it's it's kind of like, it's like it doesn't have a high failure, failure tolerance, right? Like if you look at like a normal education system, you're pretty happy if like 70 or 80% of people are making it through, you know, smoothly and like learning what they're supposed to do. And like, I know in the, in the US that's a little bit strange right now, but um, yeah, it's like, when you're talking like crypto, this is like, and you're like, it's people's funds or whatever. Um, 99% is not an acceptable education rate. Like you can't just have 1% of the world having their private key stolen mm. like that, that, that won't work. So um, I think it really needs to be better. It just needs to be abstracted away um, and it'll come like, it's just, it's super early um, and it's just not there yet. 
Yeah, I was I was interested to see where you're going with that because that was one of the first times that I've heard uh, anti-education thrown out on the on the channel. But uh, <laughs> so just from like a general standpoint, and again, if if you want to like get back into uh, anything that we might have missed as far as polka dot and, and parody is concerned, but kind of wanted to touch on uh, these ideas of like reputation and identity and in how those play into the blockchain because you obviously obviously have done a ton of research you're a research analyst so i'm kind of coming to you saying i'm super interested in reputation i'm super into identity well how do those play out um in the blockchain landscape going forward yeah um i don't know i haven't actually done like a ton of research on i can only research so many things yeah um (laughs) but yeah i think like there's obviously you know some issues with identity on chain, um, especially like, I mean, the problem now is that like everything, like in web two is that everything just gets linked together, right? Like Google knows everything about you. Mm. Um, And hopefully we avoid that um, going forward. And so I have heard some actually like really cool identity solutions though, um, from researchers like um, there, there was one of like, you know, like a zero knowledge proof on top of a ring signature thing that basically lets you prove that you have a certain identity without giving it away. So you, you could say like, um, if you go to sign up for like some service, you could say like, yes, like I have like this, this, this identity and this reputation or whatever without revealing like what other services you're actually a part of. Um, and yeah, I think like that, that kind of stuff will be really cool. So you can have like, a lot of verification um, to say like, I'm a member or like the other way too. Like if you're going to a group and you don't want to reveal that you're a member of all these other groups, but you could also like make a claim that I'm a member of some group without revealing from any information about that group at all. Um, Just like, yes, I'm a member of this group. Um, So I think like there will be a lot of innovation there. And like, you know, if anything comes from this blockchain like journey over the last 10 years is that there's been a ton of research into cryptography um and zero knowledge proofs are just like we see new techniques like every year or like even every couple of months it seems like there's like some something new you can do and so yeah i i think like there will be like a lot of good stuff coming out of the identity area i just don't really know what it looks like yet got it what are you you, like most excited about that you know um uh, in crypto that, that besides polka dot you know and and, and uh pair chains and working with different uh, blockchains what's what's something else that's like you know is a really hot sector that is you know is 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 coming up right now basically like DeFi, for example or like privacy coins you know like uh, do you have a, s- a sector that you think that is going to be really hot you know and it's on the brink of uh popping off oh boy i don't know i don't follow enough um i'm so like heads down working on polka dot right now um i think like i mentioned earlier i'm really excited to see some application that's like not a blockchain itself but is when we have like blockchain composability and interfaces stable enough that you can like build an application on top of them um without having a blockchain without having to build your own blockchain to just do everything um yeah as far as applications i mean like i find you know like one of our like guiding principles here is to make things as abstract and generic as possible. And so um, I'm really excited to see what people build on it. And it's just like, I don't think I'm the person to say like, what's the best application or anything. Um, I think there are much more creative people that can do that w- with our platform. Awesome. Well, Joe, this has been a great interview. We do have uh, like our last standard two questions that we, that we get to, uh, you know, it would be where can they, you know, find more about you as well as the Polkadot Network, Parity Technologies, Web3. How can they find uh, all of this information? Yeah. So, um, you know, Polkadot is on Twitter at Polkadot Network. Um, Parity as well, like at Parity Technologies or Parity.io. Um, and me, like, I'm not super active on uh, social media. I have a Twitter account. I don't really use it. Um, I guess if you want to get in touch, you can just send me an email, uh, joe at Parity.io. Awesome. And then the last question would be a book recommendation that uh, you maybe have read recently or read a long time ago and stuck with you. Uh, it can be any genre. It doesn't need to be about, you know, cryptocurrency or blockchain. Any any uh, book recommendation you have? Yeah. Do, am I limited to just one? Or can no. We, can we, just, <laughs> can we start a new can we start a new podcast episode of just talking about books now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. All right, guys, I'm linking in the description. We're headed to a new episode. See you there. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I read a lot. Um, I'm going to go like full non-blockchain on this one because I think like 
you probably get a lot of people who say like surveillance capitalism or or like something about about blockchain um yeah i really like uh maggie nelson is probably my favorite author um she has a book blue ads that i think is really good um some of the other ones that, like my favorites like diaries of anias nin i'm like really hacking your question because that's like a seven volume series so um, <laughs> taking um and then like yeah like uh, Anna Akhmatova and Marina Tsvatayeva, like really good poets. I really like them. Um, Master and Margarita, like uh, yeah. Bulgakov, like really great. And then, um, yeah, I would say like recent, the, the recent book that I read that I really liked was um, The Good War by Studs Terkel, which is an oral history of World War II. Um, and like just a lot of like really interesting stories and interviews. So um, I, I guess I'll cut myself off there. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> that, that, that's probably the best answer that we've heard so far in terms of the amount of books. <laughs> that, yeah. Uh, all right. Recommended. So that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll throw one more in there. Uh, one of my favorites, Confederacy of Dunces uh, by John Kennedy Tool. That's a great one. Got that, you. That's a fun title. <laughs> well, pound for pound. <laughs> yeah. That was the most pages that we've gotten recommended. So hopefully you guys at home, uh, will go through those, uh, within a week. I'm sure it'll take you a little bit longer. I'm just kidding. But, uh, yeah, Joe, <laughs> what's that? So go to the bookstore, everybody. <laughs> then, yeah. While they're still around, go there. Uh, but Joe, uh, this has been a great interview, man. We appreciate you coming on. Hopefully we can have, uh, you or another member of, of Polkadot on soon as you guys look to, you know, launch mainnet and, and, in a year or two we can talk all the parachains that are launching on the network so thank you yeah thanks for having me we'd love to come back thanks a lot joe bye